Okay, so there is, for anybody that is new to me, a really warm welcome to you, and of course a very warm welcome to you if you're not new to me as well. But my name is Karen Welding, I am director at EY Maths. I am a former teacher, I've taught early years, so three, three and four and four and five year olds, right up to 11 year olds. I've been a senior leader in a school or in schools. I've been a local authority advisor and pre-COVID, I used to teach teachers maths all over the world. So teachers of all year groups, right through primary and into secondary as well. So I am here now that I bespoke, I specialise in early years, and I've kind of extended that as well. I'm very precious about the five and six year olds that in England it's called year one, because that transition from early years to that year group is really badly provided for. And the teachers suffer, but most of all, of course, the children suffer. And it has a very long lasting impact on children's attitudes and attainment in maths. Many of you I know live in countries where actually your five and six year olds might be the first year in school as well. So we've got home educators, parents and everybody on with us. So I want you to see what I'm going to give you today, which is all based around the idea of not teaching automatic recall of number bombs. And I will go into that in a minute. There's so much to this, but I want you to know that regardless of where you are in the world, if you are interested in doing the best for your children and they're three to six or older and you want to go back and reverse or add in things that are missing, this is what's going to really help you. That's my job. OK, so my job is not just about helping those of you working with young children. It's about giving you the knowledge so that you can do a brilliant job at providing foundations and reversing things that have happened to children because people may have been working very hard but they didn't have the right tools in their toolbox as educators and none of us can do a great job until we are given what we need so let me know if that makes sense to you hello everybody saying hi lovely to have you on lots and lots of people because that's really you know very important that's why it's so good when we do this live okay so i've got lots to share with you the reason the main reason I'm doing this specifically is we're moving into the summer term in England and every year things come up on people's planning. Perhaps people are over-reliant on a scheme and you're only ever going to be over-reliant on a scheme because you don't have the confidence and skills yet to not be. And you're hanging on for dear life thinking, I don't completely know how to do this and I've got a job to do and I want to do my best. And because you don't know enough yet, you hang on to the scheme and, you, and you'll even, there are some schools that might monitor you with an inch of your life in using that scheme, but usually it becomes a bit of an excuse if we're really honest, because it's the, my school insists I use this. Well, you can use it, but don't follow it. So we see discussions coming up and they, I'm sure all of you can relate to feeling like this if you don't talk like this now. Because it's not a judgment call, it's a where are you on your journey of having the right tools to teach with, okay? But you will see posts that say things like, anybody got any great ideas for teaching automatic recall of number bonds? Or anybody, my school said, I have to teach number bonds to 10. Anybody got any great ideas for this? Now, number of things there. Okay, I've got to just you can hear me getting my head in gear here. All right, the first thing we've got to do, there's loads of stuff we've got to do here. It's all connected and all really simple. And everything I do to support all of you is connected. All right, so every time you get a tool from me, you don't need another tool. It's like a Swiss army knife. You have a tool coming off a tool. Okay, and it all will, every time you learn something, it will strengthen something else. So what I'm going to do to begin with is say that your destination is the most important thing. What you believe you have to teach, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do, and remember, if you don't teach from the early learning goals in England, it doesn't matter. Have a look at where this is happening in the curriculum you're teaching from. Maybe your curriculum is much better, but um, I know there are far more curricula out there that aren't doing this as well as they need to. So let's have a look here. Okay, let's get rid of that. So here on my slide, 
automatically recall, without reference to rhymes, counting or other aids, number bombs up to five, including subtraction facts, and some number bombs to ten, including double facts. Right, there is so much in that statement that we need to break it up for a start. One of my main points this morning when I came on and said I was going to do this is there is no point in having a statement like that and not giving the practitioner, the educator, the knowledge to understand what this means. It doesn't do that. It doesn't tell you why children need number bonds. It doesn't tell you what a number bond is. It doesn't tell you why it says without reference to rhymes, counting or other aids. We have a lot of discussions about that. It doesn't talk about the inverse relationship between addition and subtraction. In fact, it doesn't mention addition. And then it says some number bonds, so which ones? And doubles facts. Well, we have doubling and halving in the early learning goals as well. So, oh my goodness, it's such a mess. And therefore, it is only about what you understand. Does that make sense to everybody? So if you think, if you take one part of that out of there, and you think, I've got to teach my children to automatically recall number bonds. So if you say, if this is to 10, so if you say four, they say six. If you say eight, they say two. Now, for a start, that is not actually going to give them any mathematical skills, if you could get them to do that. And so few children can learn to do that because the brain doesn't learn things when it doesn't see the point. The brain doesn't learn things that it doesn't get to practice and use. You learn when you apply a skill. You don't learn when you just can say something when someone clicks their fingers. That's not learning, that's memorising. And memorising can be very useful on top of understanding. So the example I often give is if you understand what a rainbow is and you want to remember the order of the colours, then reciting Richard of York gave battle in vain, which gives you the beginning of each colour name letter. That's a really good mnemonic to help you remember something. And you memorise that mnemonic so it helps you. But if you don't understand what a rainbow is and you don't look at a rainbow and then use that information, having that mnemonic to hand means nothing. And in, in, you know, we can go down the road of saying it's actually appearing to be knowledge and you think it's actually like a chocolate fire guard. It's not helpful. OK, so there's many, many things here we have to look at. And you'll hear me pausing a lot because there's so many aspects to this. And I want to make sure that the message I give you today is very, very clear. Your job is not to get your children to recall those facts like a robot. Okay, so I'm going to come all the way back to this later, but if you aim for children who can recall those facts, then you are going to go down the road of singing songs, using YouTube videos, playing games, and you know what, I'm, I'm so old now, we didn't have the YouTube videos, but I have done all of this, and lots of you have heard me talk about this, I have played every game there is to get my year ones and my, uh, it was my, mainly my year ones, it wasn't even my reception children, to remember these facts. And the same year ones that are perfectly bright get to year two, get to year three, get to year four, and they cannot apply this knowledge, which was the whole point of giving it to them in the first place. All right, so I hope that makes sense to you. It is not about trying to just get them to say the facts. There's no point in that. However, what we can do is change our destination and as a result of having the right destination, your children will be able to do this. But they will be able to do it in the same way as you can recall information that is important. So you can think now of anything like maybe the ingredients to a recipe that you like or a cocktail, depending on what mood you're in, or the directions to get somewhere, I mean, anything in life. When you have been somewhere many times and someone says, how do I get there? You visualize that journey and you don't memorize steps that someone said to you many, many times and you've just learned to say back. You use your memory of the actual experience. And as I say, if there are ways of then sharpening that, 
by using a, some sort of mnemonic or some sort of trick, that is absolutely fine. And that is the role, if you want to, of putting in rhymes and songs. But I would still be really careful with that with number bombs because rhymes and songs with young children, they're not going to be strong enough on the actual clarity of the mathematics going on. That's hard enough on its own. If you start throwing songs and rhymes at it as well, you heighten the cognitive load, loads. And they'll remember the songs and rhymes, but they won't recognize the mathematics. So can you see, the first thing we have to look at is, you know, and it's not, it's not your fault if you've been doing this. It's the fault of a curriculum that doesn't tell you what it means. And there's other things we need to unpick here as well. It doesn't give you enough information. Your training didn't give you this information. Your schools aren't giving you this information. So you have to go and find it out for yourself. Now that isn't the way things should be, but it is the way it is. All right, so the reason it says there without reference to rhymes, counting or other aids is because quite rightly, this is saying a child who can recall those facts within a rhyme or I don't know what the reference to counting is about. I guess it's them holding up 10 fingers and counting out six and counting out four, but I very much doubt they do that. Or other aids is they don't want to see a parrot or a robot. They want to see evidence of a child who can really understand this. But then they throw in the phrase automatic recall and don't explain how easily misconstrued that can be. So tell me at this stage, does it make sense that you become automatic at something because you build neural pathways in your brain. So anything you can do without thinking very much, sorry, that person looks a little bit healed, don't they? Sometimes my little brains are better than others. Okay, when you have an experience, your brain builds a neural pathway, actually organically lays down matter and fires electricity along it. Every time you apply that skill, it gets stronger. Now you could argue that, well, we say our, our number bonds every day and my children get stronger and stronger and stronger. Trouble is you're building one pathway and that pathway, if it's not used, will start to fade. And also more dangerously, when you have a real life experience and you use your skills and they're connected, you don't build one pathway, you build a network Hi everyone, I stopped my presentation, you know, mid, mid rant or not mid rant, in the flow. And uh, let me just, oh, just gonna get rid of this. Tell me if this is better. I'm just gonna switch my camera off. Uh, I've got double me, that's far too much for anybody. Um, I have stopped it, but it will have recorded up to the point I got to and I can show you that. Tell me if, th is this working? Cause I'm on my phone. I won't be able to show you what I was going to show you on the screen, but I can still continue to do the training because lots of you obviously have come, especially, and it's you put that time aside. I'm not going to be able to train in the same way because what I was using was a, a way of being able to switch between my screen and me, and now you've just got me. Okay, so I will do my best this way. Um, great, all right. So I will put the first bit of training on the group, but I'm just going to briefly recap and then I want you to go and find this on, find the first part on the group later. All right. So the, the main thing that I was showing, if I show you on here, oh, hang on a minute, I'm going to re redo things. Okay. Was the idea that you, let's see if we can, anybody knows me well knows, honestly, I'm never beaten by these things, but this idea here was you've got to have your destination, right? Your destination is not to teach children to recall number facts, number bonds in this case, without any understanding. If that, if you think that is your destination because the curriculum implies that, and I've talked about that in the first section that you'll be able to watch later, you are going to give your children learning that instead of creating a network like this, which is, this is my very bad picture of the human brain that you would have seen me drawing and you couldn't hear what I was saying, but this is a network of memories based on using and applying, and that will end up with you being able to recall something pretty instantly because you created these amazing strong neural networks in your brain. So I want you to be really clear before I go any further, and what I'm saying here is 
when I say do not teach your children to automatically recall number bonds, the first thing I'm saying is you're not trying to get them to I say something, you say something. We're not trying to get them to bark stuff at us that they can do, the ones that are good, good at memorising, but it means nothing. And the majority of them may learn what I showed before. Where's my pen gone? You might get, let's just rub some of these neural connections out. We've all had this done to us. Somebody says, practice this skill, practice this skill, practice this skill, practice this fact. And your neural network gets pretty strong. But when you stop using it or you don't apply it, it will start to fade very quickly. And that's why you forget. And also you are relying on them being able to find that in the brain to recall it. Whereas when it's been used and applied and it's meaningful, the brain will have built up a network of connections. So what I was saying that you might not have heard me say earlier is my whole job is to show you that all mathematics is connected. And when I'm talking about number like this, all number is the same set of skills, just kind of looked at in a slight, from a slightly different angle is the best way I can describe it. It's like the uh, Swiss army knife approach, not separate skills. You can't teach maths as linear. It has to be connected. Just like when you're teaching writing, you don't teach one skill and abandon everything else. And if you did the last challenge with me, you'll know we talked about that. Okay, so I want you to, um, be really clear on what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. So to recap on things you might not have heard because of the glitchy internet, the statements in most curricula around the world are worse than useless. They are misleading, they lack exemplification, they don't give you the skills and tools you need, you're not getting that in your training, you're not getting that from your school, you weren't taught it yourself, and it doesn't matter how hard you try and how conscientious you are and how intelligent you are, when you look in your toolbox, if the wrong tools are in there or there's no tools in there, no amount of effort is going to get you there. OK, so that's what we have to start by thinking. Now, other things we have to think about are what does number bonds actually mean? So you've got to teach something. You need to understand it yourself. So number bonds are when we partition a number into two parts. Later on, when we get past whole numbers, and we actually start getting into what we call rational numbers with children. And we might have 5.5 and 4.5 equaling 10, which is, of course, really important if you've got a £10 budget and you spent £5.50 and so forth. That, by the way, is using bonds at 10. A bond is when you split something into two parts. OK, so we've got bonds of each of the whole numbers when we're looking at the age group we're working with. But we're only looking, therefore, at two parts. So if you think about what often... People call a cherry model. Let me just bring my board back in again here. I'm not going to be able to show you it in the way that I was, I'm afraid, but we'll do our best. So anybody who's just joined me, we've had a very glitchy internet, so I've had to switch how I'm presenting to you. So pretty much all schemes that I've ever seen show something like this. So if you've got four, for example, a number bond of four could be one and three, yeah, or two and two and that sort of thing. So a bond is when you divide something into two groups, yeah? It, you're partitioning the number, composition of number. Composition of number comes from part whole. Part whole comes from subitizing, okay? Not counting. Again, lots of things to share there. So it's all connected. However, so that's a bond. You can have number facts. If you have four, let's have four. It's not just about split it into two twos, split it into three and a one, split it into four and a zero. You can also have like a one and a one and a two. And all of you have done lots of subitizing with me. We look at this with our three year olds right at the beginning. You could have a one and a one and a one and a one. Now, you need to understand number facts because that is four. Some of you have done this with me on training in the tens course, teaching essential number sense. One of the ways of splitting four into our number facts what's four made up of it's a one and a one and a one and a one you need to know that for division you need to know the equal ways that four will divide and it's not just two and two and a good example if we change that to six just ignore the lines there for the moment because the wrong number of lines but you can split six into two and two and two you can split six into three and three you can split six 
equally and unequally, but you could have six ones. Can you see that number bonds are not the be all and end all? There's number facts as well. And what you have to ask yourself, and that's the most important thing, is why do these children need number bonds? Why do these children need number facts? And it is not so you can tick off something in your curriculum. It is not so you get the, someone off your back that you've done your job. I've been there, I know how that feels. You've got to be thinking about what tools do you need to understand why these matter? How are these going to serve this child in the future? And the more you understand of that on your own level, which is why I exist, to give you that knowledge. My job is not about providing activities for children. I do that eventually, but there's really no point in me giving you activities if you don't understand the maths because you won't interact in the right way. You won't, you know, wait for the right things from the children. You won't guide them in the right way. You won't shut up at the right times, you know, because that's what teaching maths well looks and sounds like. So we need to look uh, if you've got paper and pen with you, the first thing I said was your destination needs to be right. You need to understand that your job is to teach mathematical understanding and application. You can only do that when you have the right tools in your toolbox. So do you understand what number bonds are? That division into two groups, not necessarily equal groups, of course, but division into equal groups is then how that connects with division. Are you thinking about the fact that Again, depending on how much work you've done with me, because no one else seems to be talking about subitizing in the way that I would teach you, that we look at the parts of a whole without ever looking at the total amount to begin with when we do subitizing. So, <laughs> Paul's board in again. So again, these are, these are all things that are available on my YouTube channel, but we might have with our three-year-olds, we drop this from a height and we're not interested in how many all together. We're just, what do we see? What do we notice? And we teach our children to look for twos and ones. And maybe in time, this isn't a particularly great arrangement, they might fall like this and we look and they know that that amount, and if I move that away a little bit, so you can see that. So they know that amount is different to that amount and that amount. If you, if you offered them something they like to eat and you offered them this amount or this amount, they're gonna go for this amount because it's more. They know it's not the same amount, but they haven't got the number name in their language yet to say it. And this amount again is, you know, there's more of it. In time, they realize there's a two there and a one there, and it's a three and there's a one and a one and a one and so forth. So that perceptual subitizing, when you're not looking at the total, because if you were looking at joining the total, that's conceptual subitizing, that is part whole. Part whole then becomes, is the basis for number bonds and number facts. It's the composition of number. So if you're working, for example, with the NCETM mastering number, you have to ask yourself, why is comparison, which I've just shown you there, two compared to one compared to three, that's comparison. Why is that separate from composition, which is also how those larger numbers have got the smaller amounts in them, or the larger amounts got the smaller amounts that you can label as numbers? Why is that separate from cardinality, which cardinality that is the quantity, labeling the quantity, these things are all connected. And when we get to the point where we are learning number bonds, all they are are the parts that go together to equal, in this case, for today's training, to go together to equal 10. Why 10? Because 10 is the base of our whole number system. But if you go into this blindly and you think, right, in the next few weeks, I've got to get them to be able to say the number bonds of 10. And you haven't spent time thinking about this because who's given you this knowledge? You are never, ever going to be successful. And even if you get your children to be able to say it back to you, most of them won't. Most of them won't realise why they're learning it. The ones that do won't understand why they're learning it. And you occasionally get a child that learns in spite of us and nobody wants to go down that route. So I've got a little activity for you first, which I was going to do in a slightly different way until my internet was glitchy. So here we go. Right. I'm going to show you an example, I hope, to show you how if we aim to teach automatic recall and that's what we're aiming to teach, we're going to fail and we're going to fail our children. And nobody that wants to be a good teacher 
wants to do that. OK, and even if you don't want to be a good teacher, it still won't work. So here is my little um, example board for you. So these are called bonds of S. It's not five, it's bonds of S. OK, so H plus C equals S. T plus S equals S. P plus M equals S. OK, so you ready in the chat box? OK, in fact, I'll be kind, I'll do them again. Don't write them down because that's cheating. H plus C equals S. T plus S equals S. P plus M equals S. And don't forget, that also means, of course, we could do this. If I get the first example, try and hold it. I know it's backwards for you, by the way. I'm on my phone. That's why nobody pointed it out. Something plus C equals S. Oh, look, it's H. And S is equal to H plus something. Don't forget, these are things that we want our children to thoroughly understand around five and six years old. OK, so what goes with T to equal S? Pop it in the chat box. And if anybody loses the will to live at any point, please tell me. I think I'm going to have to put my computer on because I can't see anybody's comments unless nobody's talking to me, of course. You might just be listening. Let's have a look. Oh, let's have a look. H plus C equals S. Oh, some. Oh, yeah, Sarah's. Oh, good. It is coming up because I don't want to have to look at my computer as well. OK, so I can't even remember the question now. What did I say? What what goes with what goes with? You see, I'll have to ask it again now because I'm too busy multitasking. Right. I'll ask a new one. What goes with P to equal S? I know where I'm looking now. <laughs> what goes with P? So some, so let's have a look. some people think S. So P plus something equals S. T equals zero. Or is that an O, Vicky? OK, so it was P plus M equals S, everybody. Let's do one more, shall we? Look at this neutral face. Um, OK, what goes with uh, S to equal S? <laughs> and I want you to look at what's happening in the chat box. We're firing out letters just like our children fire out responses like you know it's like throwing spaghetti on the wall which one's going to stick okay there isn't really anything to learn here is there it's like can you remember what i showed you or not and if i tested you on this in an hour or tomorrow i wonder where you'd be right now i'm going to tell you that s means sandwich OK, these are bonds of sandwiches. I had to think about this for a really long time to come up with a good example. I hope this works for you. This is ham and cheese. This is tuna and sweet corn. This is prawn and mayonnaise. And then I ran out of ideas that had different letters. So ham and cheese, tuna and sweet corn, prawn and mayonnaise. OK, and I know it's backwards. All right. OK, so what goes with tuna? I haven't brought a drink. I'm suddenly getting all parched here. It's the stress of my internet not working. What goes with tuna? <laughs> right, I have gone with well-known sandwiches here. I'll do them again, OK? Ham and cheese, tuna and sweet corn, prawn and mayonnaise. These are actually sandwiches, aren't they? OK, so thank you, Charlotte. OK. So maybe those those comments were from earlier. So tuna goes to sweet corn. What goes with ham? Yeah, it does, Helen, but not in mine. OK, because I had to come up with lots of different letters. I had, had mayonnaise for the prawn already. OK, so we've got tuna and sweet corn. What goes with the ham? Because because there's a delay, it's quite funny because I'm, I'm getting the last answers now. Ham and cheese. OK, well done. What goes with the prawn? In my examples. <laughs> and no one's allowed to go, I don't like prawn sandwiches. Hello, Zoe. She's uh, watching. Right, right, the whole thing. What goes with the ham? Jeez. OK, my point there is, OK, when you make it about random letters and abstract ideas your brain has got nothing to attach it to it doesn't blooming care there's nothing to remember so you're saying to your children you know I'm going to rub these off now I mean right look yeah you're saying to your kids right everybody we're doing bonds of 10 
and there's a lot more than my three sandwiches and we're going to do the 1 plus 9 equals 10 and 2 plus 8 equals 10. I'm just going to do three of them and 3 plus 7 equals 10. Okay, that everybody is just like the sandwiches. It's a wiggle and a sign that you're not teaching them really what it means and certainly the amount of practitioners who don't know what that means is amazing. If you're trying to teach them to say this or sing it or write it, it's ridiculous. If they're not going to, there's nothing for the brain to make sense of. There is nothing for the brain to remember. There is nothing for the brain to engage in. It doesn't work. Okay, so, and also, interestingly, can you see we've now got people thinking about things like pickle and prawn and mayo. Now, maybe again, with the children, you know, when we get to the four or the five, they're like, I'm five, because numbers have different meanings to them and not the meanings you want. Does all that make sense, everybody, so far? It doesn't matter if you bring Jack Hartman in. It doesn't matter if you've got a brilliant rhyme. You're not teaching them to understand something that they're going to use and learn. OK, so this is me in mild rant mode. OK. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so. All right. <laughs> you need your CPA to hang your hat on. Yeah. Well, don't even think of it as CPA, concrete pictorial abstract. Just think of it as all humans learn when their learning is purposeful. End of. OK, the human brain is very sophisticated. It only wants to solve problems that serve itself. OK, so remember, this is a short session. My entire life is about the things I've discussed with you so far. So you can go onto YouTube and learn about the subitizing I've mentioned, the part hole, the composition, the cardinality, the you know comparison. It's all connected. OK, thank you, Kelly J. Burns, who's one of my greater impact members. I mean, Kelly, any of my other impact members, they will tell you about their journey from when they first had a session like this with me and they went, oh, my goodness, brains leaking out of ears. OK, in a good way. Right. So what do we do instead? Do we teach our children? Absolutely. You can't learn something if you're not taught it. OK, so when I say don't teach automatic recall of number bonds, what I'm saying is don't aim don't aim your activities at this robotic recall. Aim your activities at giving them an understanding of what it means to have a bond within a number. And that also has to be related to this idea of facts. So the idea that a number is made up of parts and what's special about a bond is it's just when you split it into two parts. And if you split it into two equal parts, that's halving. Yeah. And if you get those that, that part and you replicate it, that's doubling. OK, so this is where all of this starts to join together. Yeah. So never teach anything. Absolutely. Kay. Don't teach anything in isolation because learning does not happen in isolation. Remember? OK. And we said someone just put a cross face on. I hope that wasn't aimed at me. I hope that's just because they're cross about isolation. Um, OK, so let's have a look. Don't forget, this is not me teaching everything you need to know in one session. But when you build up your subitizing, if you've done training with me, you know we always use a five frame to begin with. And the five frame is so powerful. I'm going to show you a 10 frame, but because I can't show you my board in the way that I normally would. But I want you to kind of edit out that bottom one for the moment. We always go for a five frame first. And it's what's not there that is as relevant as what is there and we start off with self-registration and so forth and we say things like one on a five frame to a young child that puts their face up here when they arrive in school for a self-registration on a five frame there's still a lot of space it's not full you know they're going to see there's a lot of children that can still come now they might not have any idea how much that is it doesn't matter another child arrives and because we're doing our subitizing with our low cognitive load things, things that are the same size, same colour, same shape, naturally, and man-made objects. Again, loads of ideas from me on this group, on the YouTube channel, in the memberships that I run. In time, right, your children know that amount and that amount aren't the same amount. You don't need to teach them that. They have that since birth. They just don't know what that's called. OK, who keeps doing the cross faces? Can you tell me why you're putting cross faces up unless you've got someone else hitting the button? Because if you are upset by something, do tell me. So this amount is different to this amount. 
and the subitizing you do helps them understand that we've got when we learn to call this one in English obviously if English isn't their first language they're going to call it another name showing the names are not important but if that's one that's also one and together they're called two they know that when they add another one yeah it makes sense doesn't it add another one you've got a one and a one and a one and all together it's another amount it's got another name but look what's happening here we've got fewer spaces left and they get very excited with self-registration because when that child arrives and these would be photographs for self-registration <gasps> there's only this amount of space left they might not know what this is called yet but you see them getting jiggy because they know <gasps> when the next child comes it's going to be full and then they know they need to go and get another five frame and it's not about what this is called altogether it's just about its image within the five frame look that five frame's not full yet now it is okay that's how you begin to build up to number bonds you also if i use my other board you're bringing in as i mentioned before imagine these have been dropped from a height even with our very youngest children and we do this in the challenges and we're not interested in how many all together we've seen there's a two there and there's a one there and a one there and a two there and a one there. So what you're teaching them is to look for parts within the whole. OK, you build up gradually. Those of you who've done lots of training with me know we always do one to three first because children are born knowing that that amount and that amount are different amounts. They just haven't got the number labels yet. They don't need to be able to count for cardinality for that. Cardinality would be one, two, three. They do need number names, though, and you get that by singing songs and rhymes and so forth with number names in them. This is called one. When two ones are together, it's called two. When this comes all together, this is three. And what we do, again, on all the training that I do, if you want to know more, is we do what we call move it to prove it. When they learn to label that, we'll say things like, I can see a two and a one in there. And you're like, well, move it to prove it. And they say, look, there's a two and there's a one and put it back together and it's a three. What else can we do? Oh, I can see a one and a one and a one. Put it back together, there's a three. Can you see what I did first was part whole, two and one creates a three, it's inside a three. That's a number bond. One and one and one, move it to prove it inside a three. That's a number fact, but they're both part whole. Yeah, that's why we don't say part, part, whole, because it's not just two parts. So that skill that they start at three is what leads to number bonds. Using five frames is what leads to number bonds. Starting to do what I've done here and say, I know it's a three because it's got a two and a one in it. I know it's a two because it's got a one and a one in it. That's the, the early part of conceptual subitizing. And it means that when we do this, and you can't, perceptually subitize four. So again, this massive myth. Do not let someone on a course tell you that the human brain can instantly see four. It can't unless it's in a known pattern. When you look at this, you are very likely as an adult to see maybe three and one or two and two and you join them. That's conceptual subitizing. Children know this isn't three anymore because three's got a two and a one in it and this one's got another one. Whatever this number is, has got a two and a one and a one and a two and a two and it's got three and one more, or it's got one and one and one and one. So they're starting to use this idea about proving it through the properties. Can you see, you can't go into suddenly teaching number bonds using a 10 frame, unless you have done these things first. So I'm gonna pause there for a moment. Um, yeah, so they will, yeah, because it reminds them of a triangle. Like, what is it about a triangle? We know it isn't officially a triangle, but it's got that, that link to triangles. Um, did we find out who'd been doing the uh, the cross face? Uh, doing a happy dance, says Nicola. That's good. Would you use their photo for self-registration? Absolutely. Um, I've got things I can share with you about how to do that. OK, so loads more to come on that. All right. Does that make sense so far, everybody? So let's go back. So when we start thinking about a number bond, it's how many more will I need to create, a, you know, to get to the number I want to get to. So when we're looking at, for example, self-registration, we're doing work like this with our children separately. And then when we're doing it with self-registration, where there's photographs here, 
we're either holding this up next to it and making that connection or we're using the self-registration in our teacher directed time where we are holding on to the learning and we're sharpening that skill or we're saying imagine these are you coming in in the morning oh look there's one you know what can you see and they'll say it's not full yet it's not finished yet and what we can do as well is if i imagine this isn't here again i would normally have a bigger board but if we're looking at four randomly and the children might say well i can see a two and a one and a one or a two and a two even when it's on the five frame it still has the same properties i can still see the two and the one and the one i can still see the two and the two okay so you've got to make these connections then we've got the idea that if we have five children at snack time and we've only got this many strawberries have we got enough for each child so the idea of saying well no because look five it would be full so we'd need one more so therefore four plus one i can use my other the colored counter here four plus one is five within the five there's a four and a one there's number bonds children can understand so this sort of stuff has to be built up really gradually and it is about what you understand okay so i'm going to jump ahead a moment in a little while so just i'm going to read your comments and see if we've got any questions if anybody wants to ask anything put a capital q but i want you to think how much training have i done with karen how much of this is second nature to me now or am i just arriving here for the first time and i've been trying to use rhymes and songs and get my children to do instant recall and my destination i've realized is wrong and needs to change we all were there at the beginning of our journeys and you can't miss any steps out you need to help to get those tools in your toolbox and believe me the difference it will make to your children because they will only develop automatic recall of anything when they use it and when they use it to solve problems that are meaningful to them so i've got lots of messages popping up on my phone what do you do oh, if the children haven't been using five frames and are now struggling to be able to see number bonds to 10? Yeah, you have to go back to five frames because the five, two fives within 10 are so important. OK, if I am going to in the future deal with decimals, deal with the idea of 0 0.7 plus something equals one or 0 0.7 plus something equals two, the idea of having that 0 0.3 and the 0 0.7, that is just my number bonds to 10. And what's so helpful is understanding that seven. Let's have, let's have a look at this. The most frustrating thing for me when I do training like this is there's just so much I wanna share with you. <laughs> I can't keep you on for hours and hours. So imagine this is worth one. It always was, okay? And I know this for some people might feel a bit strange me talking like this, but that's 10 parts. If that's worth one, I could say I've got, I haven't got a whole one yet, the whole one's been divided into 10 parts and I've got seven of those parts. So that number, if it was decimals with an older child, like Emma's asking, would be no whole one. But I can tell you that it's been split into 10 parts. That's what that dot's for. Very clever little dot. It says I've taken the whole and split it into 10 parts. So I'm going to tell you how many of those 10 parts. And I've got seven. So can you see Emma there that... You know it's seven because it's a full five and two of the next one. That's a really powerful concept image to have. If I had, like your son, if I had to do 0 0.7 plus 0 0.7 or 0, plus 7, 0 0.7 times two, and I had another 0 0.7 here, being able to take those two fives and make a whole one and the two 0 0.2s and make 0 0.4, so it'd be 1.4, it's the extraction of the fives that's allowing me to do that. So nobody, you know, nobody must think of a five frame as being the territory of a three-year-old. It's the step towards understanding how to deal with a 10, because a 10 being made of those two fives. You'd also use it, for example, if you wanted to add 60 pence and 60 pence, probably not the best example these days, 60 pounds, 60 pounds. Extract the two 50 pounds to make 100 pounds and then extract the two 10 pounds to make 20 pounds, 120 pounds. That's good fluent mathematics. So can everybody see, this is about teaching number sense. This is not about teaching little children. You haven't been given this when you were at school, so you need to learn it from the beginning as well. And you can see it's really sophisticated, but it's actually really easy because you never go above 10. The minute you get to 10, 
Let's rub that off. The minute you fill that, you're just going to start a new 10. And you know I do lots and lots of training on this to describe, if anybody hasn't seen this before, things like... Let's, of course, you've, I've been showing the fives pattern, but once you get to a 10 frame, you can learn a four that way and that way, because depending on what calculations you're doing, it can really help you. But study the tens course if you want to know more about this. I'm going to leave it like that just for today, because that's the way I've been showing you. But that's why 14 is written the way it's written. It's one full 10 frame and four of the next 10 frame, not four ones. It is four ones, but that's not very helpful in way of thinking about it. Look, it's four out of 10. Can you see what's not there yet? Look at that shape that's not there yet. It's five. It's a full five and one of the next one. Yeah, so it's this using this idea of images to help you see. How are we doing? So I'm going to show one example to help see why we need this. And then I'm going to direct you to some resources. So things, if you've just joined us, I was on my computer so that you could see my screen and I could move backwards and forwards, but it was glitching really badly. So I've come onto my phone, which means I can't show you what I was going to show you in the same way. Um, oh, brilliant, Emma. I'm so glad to hear it. Uh, right, Catherine Hood. Did you say children can't subitize to four or can? Catherine Hood, you know the answer to that, having been in my will for the longest. Um, nobody, it's not children, nobody Adults or children can subitize past three unless it's in a known pattern. The minute you get four randomly like this, you will only know it's four instantly if you are using some sort of recognisable pattern. What you're almost certainly doing when you see this is you might be doing, well, I know three and one is four. I know two and two is four. What you're doing is so quickly because you use your subitizing all the time. But humans, remember, Catherine, when we did this, Kath, we did this right at the beginning of the tens course. You are born because of the eyes and the mouth pattern on a human. You are born being able to perceptually subitize one, two and three. But the minute you get to more than three, you will, unless it's in a recognizable pattern. There's a recognizable pattern. And a lesser thought of one, not lesser thought of in terms of how good it is, but lesser used. When you have a five frame, you can instantly see that's four because there's one missing. The great thing about patterns is you can perceptually subitize way above five when things are in a pattern. Perceptually subitizes see it instantly. Can you see there? You can see that's nine instantly. You're not breaking it up in any way. You're using the fact that you know that it is one less than ten. You can see that's eight instantly because of the two that aren't there. But you can also conceptually subitize and see the two fours, two fours or the six and the two. So if anybody needs to revisit those early principles of subitizing, that is where all of our ability as adults, as well as not just children, ability to add and subtract comes from. Because if I say here, I need 10, but I've got this many, and we know 10 is it completely filled. I need 10, I've got this many, you're gonna need two more. So if you know this is called eight, and you've learned that because there's two missing, or because you can see the fours in it, whichever way, both ways, you know that eight, plus two is equivalent to 10, but you also know that 10, when you take two away, will leave you with eight. And when you take eight away, it will leave you with two. So it's all joined together. So I'm gonna show you one more thing. And yes, <laughs> you're one of my mastery people in the, in the best sense of the word, Kath. Um, Kel, in my math scheme, there is a large emphasis on using pictorial representation using the number bond circles part whole. Do you agree with this or should we stick to the five and ten from I use both? You have to do the maths yourself. I'm presuming that's Kelly. And you have to think. And again, the best thing to do is come and do some training with me. The idea of when you have, for example, six and you pull the six down into all of its possible partitioning. You, what you must be careful with is a scheme if it only has the two groups, it's only teaching number bonds. It's not teaching children to, to look at you know number facts. You have to hold the maths in your hands. You have to, as an adult, if you sit at home when you're doing your planning and you get six counters and you physically pull them down and have a look at where they are, 
If your children are then ready to start recording that, that's fine, but the recording means nothing. The recording on its own is pointless. It's like being able to write cat, say cat, read cat, but you've never seen a cat. Just because you can read it, write it and say it doesn't mean you have any knowledge of cats. I hope that helps. Most schemes are not doing a good job. They're not giving you the knowledge you need. People are believing that they teach maths. They don't. You teach the maths. You can use a scheme for ideas. You can use a scheme to help you, I don't know, teach all areas of the, of the maths curriculum if you wish. But the trouble is they do tend to suggest that you do this for a while and stop and you do this for a while and stop and you do this for a while and stop. Doesn't work. The biggest issue with schemes, however, is people are not investing in their own knowledge before they use a scheme. If you did, you would be adjusting that scheme constantly. Schemes are just written by people like you and me, and they're limited by what they know just like we are. Scheme assisted, never scheme directed. Yeah, and honestly, the more you know, the more you'll look at yourself and go, why did I ever use anything in this? I, there's not many schemes that I look at and go, wow, that's a really fantastically relevant, engaging idea. I think there's an awful lot of people trying to miss out all the stuff that matters in terms of people writing it and going straight to the let's have something in their books. Not a problem with maths being recorded, but maths that's recorded at the expense of understanding or isn't based on understanding is completely pointless. So let's have a look before we finish for today. Got five minutes left. I'm going to recap before I do the last bit. First thing, your destination has to be focused on the fact that children need number bonds to be successful later on. They need to understand what they are. Just like that sandwich example I gave you, it's not about memorising. They need to understand what the point is. They need to be applying it all day, every day in their lives meaningfully. Children who are non-speaking in your provision or have English as a second language or whatever language is your first language have a different language as their first language. An awful lot is going on up here. Children who will never speak, they can still do this. They still have all that understanding. So don't wait again for proof verbally because mathematical understanding can be proved in many ways that verbal is useful, but it's not the end of it. So if you're trying to go for, you know, they can say this, they can sing it. So that's the most important thing. Secondly, you need to understand the maths yourself. Do you understand what a number bond is? Do you understand what a number fact is? Have you sat and physically done this and thought, what's going on here? Are you teaching it in a pure mathematical sense with very low cognitive load like this, starting with perceptual subitizing of numbers one to three, then conceptual subitizing of numbers one to three, using five frames alongside that, singing songs with number names in them, so in the language that you're teaching, so they've got those words. That isn't the same as counting for cardinality. That's what I call counting for ordinality, because you need those words, otherwise you can't label the sets. You then build up to three on a five frame, so then you can add in four. They can see that four is not the same as three. You go up to five, which fills the five frame. You do your conceptual subitizing of five, move it to prove it. You move on to the next five on the five, on the add another five frame, which gives you your first view of a 10 frame. And a six is a five, a finished five, and one of the next five. And a seven is a finished five and two of the next five. And then there's the twos pattern we add in as well, which I won't go into today. That's what you need to be doing for your children to learn. And then the brilliant news is your children will understand comparison, composition, cardinality, addition, subtraction, halving and doubles, which is multipl multiplication and division. They'll be using what they know. They will be applying it in things, clouds in the sky and tires on the ground and little tiny rice grains and counters and bird's eggs because you've given them connected tools that are meaningful. This is a lot to take on if you've not worked with me yet, but I'm hoping this is making sense and you're excited to, um, to go on the journey with me. Okay, so yeah, so don't think of it as much as an idea, Angela. You may not be saying it, it's just the wording, but it's not an idea, it's, it's a core way of teaching maths for the reason that maths exists. It's never better to do this sort of thing than it is to do, and then things like self-registration on nice activities. The 
the the maths is the self-registration this is me giving you the tool to then apply as the child in the self-registration because maths lives and breathes it does not exist in that kind of you know that detached way that we introduce it we give them a tool but they only learn when they use the tool okay so i hope that makes sense um okay i'm going to finish by looking at this then because this is the point and i'm going to use the calculation i generally always use but it's because it works really well so sorry about the rubbishy writing but 8 plus 5 which could be 80 plus 50 could be 0 0.8 plus 0 0.5 so applicable because it's base 10 system could be 800 plus 500 when you look at that i want you to end up with children who when they look at that just like if i write that i'm guessing you're thinking of a real cat it's not helpful to think about the letters or the word if you want to tell me about cats you've got to picture a real cat so just the same there you have to have concept images of what is going on here. So that's what I'm going to finish on here. And as adults, we were taught in a way that meant we were just given the abstract the whole time. So we don't picture it. And I want your children to grow up and be different to us. I want them when it's eight plus five. I'm going to do it in two colours. Oh, actually, no, I'm not actually. There are reasons to do it in two colours and some reasons not. And I can talk to you about that if you want to come and carry on learning at some point but let's get rid of those ones so that that is what they need to see in their minds when they see this because what we're going to do is combine these and the base 10 system says you're trying to always create a finished group of 10 that's what all numbers want to do is create finished groups of 10 when we get finished groups of 10 those tens want to get together as 10 groups of 10 and create what we call a unit again as a hundred so this is trying to create a unit of 10 and then this is trying to create a unit of 10 and this is going to try and create a unit of 10 and when we get to 10 tens that's why we unitize as a hundred but here if I try and move this here there isn't space for all of them even if you don't know how many this is really strongly yet but there are space for two and then I've still got three on here. So I've got one full 10 frame and three of the next 10 frames. So that's why it's 13. What you can do with your children as well is leave that down there and say, what will happen when we add the five to the eight? So they have to visualize. They can see their subitizing skills as only space for two. What will happen when that two is removed from that five? And children who've had meaningful experiences of part whole will know that when you do move it to prove it in a five, if you move two away, there's a three because there's a two and a three and a five. And they start to visualize that. So there, when they see that, just like when I write the word cat and you see a cat, our children don't see a digit eight and a five. They see this. And it's really obvious to them that they're going to get the number that in English is called 13. But in other languages isn't called 13, but in all languages is written as a one and a three. And the one is because we've finished a whole 10 and we've got three of the next 10. It is not going to work. This is my last point, and I'm hoping this will send people's brains into an absolute pickle in a good way, because I want you to change your teaching. If you are teaching children to do eight plus five like this, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 you are teaching them to count to calculate and then you're expecting them to use number bonds to solve this and instead we get children in key stage two seven to eleven year olds and younger going eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen usually they'll meet the eight and the five in a column method but you see them doing this you don't see them saying well i've got eight i'm going to add two more and then I'll leave three more to add. And of course, with this one as well, going back to Emma's question, within that eight, this isn't about number bonds so much. This is about partitioning, part whole. Can you see there, if we go back to the start, look, you could have added the two fives together. And if you keep your five frames separate, you can slide it up, make one whole ten and three of the next ten because you've extracted the five from the eight. I hope that has been helpful, everyone. Counting... If you teach counting and your scheme says teach counting, counting on in ones and back in ones to calculate, 
number bonds make no sense to children. They seem as completely separate. I think pretty much every scheme is teaching counting on and counting back in ones to calculate. That is not going to give your children fluency. It's going to fail them in number sense. And that's devastating to hear because you bought into a scheme. If you want to add five and three as a child, you teach them that when you've got five and you add three, it creates the image that is eight. When you've got two and you add another two, it creates the image that is four because in their heads, they've got such strong concept images. They understand there's a two and a two in a four. They understand there's a one and a one and a two in a four. So has this helped you? I feel like I'm getting into dance mode now. Has this helped you to, I want you to imagine you've got a table in front of you with everything you are doing to teach number bonds, what I want you to do, even if you what you've taught with me, taught with me, learned with me for four years now, I want you to sweep every single thing off that table onto the floor, and have a completely empty table in front of you, and I want you to decide what your destination is. Do you understand number bonds? Do you understand number facts? Do you know why they need this? Are you teaching them to recall things, or are you teaching them to apply knowledge so that's why they end up being able to recall it? And then look on the floor, and if this is metaphorical, if you've got anything on the floor that you go, yep, yeah, that will help me get to that destination, you can bring it back onto the table. And if you haven't, you need to chuck all of that in the bin, and you only need to bring things onto that table that are going to help you do the things that I've described to you tonight. So to help you, and I did have a very seamless way of doing this, but the internet <laughs> chucked me off, I have got number bonds activity for you a pack of them on the shop you can go and have a look now i'm going to put in the group that you can have a discount off those because i have got the self-registration i have got target games i have got snack time all the things that i'm saying you need to do if you couple that with my free youtube videos on subvertising if you haven't got that on your table yet but i'm going to give you 10 percent off them because i want you to have the ideas that you need so if you want them watch out. I will put the code above this video and I'll put the link as well. Go there. I'm going to leave that link on there for 24 hours. Okay. So we need to, I'll get this recording up and I'll try and work out a way of joining the first bit and the last bit together as well. I've got to get on and go and meet my impact members soon, 25 minutes, but yeah, go and have a look at the shop on EY Maths, but wait and I will put a link and a little discount code for you to thank you for coming along today because I want you to have those ideas. OK, so go and have a look there. Um, has that been, you know, I think we've got a real range of people on. Some people have been with me a long time and they're going to be like, this makes a lot of sense, but I still have to think a lot about this because the scheme keeps dragging you in and you get tired and life gets in the way. We get it but it's not going to work. And you are going to be thoroughly miserable when your children don't learn and thoroughly miserable when your children are not engaged. What makes you happy and fulfilled is when your children do well. And that is the only thing I'm interested in giving you the tools to keep you happy and well, because your children are learning brilliantly. OK, any um, questions, anything you want to run by me, anything that I've gone blah, 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 and talk far too fast, watch it, pause it, ask questions on here. Okay. I'm always available for everybody who wants help. I'm here. Okay. And there's loads of ways you can come and work with me. You can come and try out Impact or Pathway for a month. You don't have to stay. So go and have a look on the website there and we can answer any questions. Great. Uh, you do, Emma. Yeah. And you know, Emma, you're a brilliant example of someone. You've got your own child you're thinking about. You're a teacher in class. You are a member of Impact as well. And it just shows anybody who's earlier in this journey that, you know, I'm constantly thinking about this. I'm constantly modifying my thinking. I'm constantly sharpening my tools. OK. And it's a great way to be. OK. So, um, oh, you're very, very welcome. And thank you so much, everyone. We've had nearly 100 people on live and particularly with a little um, hiccup, but I will salvage that little bit for you. It should be recorded below this so you can watch the bit that was glitchy and it should play absolutely fine. OK, you're very welcome. Um, Impact members, I'm going to go and grab a cuppa and I'll see you in 20 minutes over on the Impact Group. Take care, everyone. See you soon.